This is the intro video for the Michelson interferometer. You're going to be using a laser in this week's experiment, so you can see a bit of the laser light over here. Lasers are very powerful and they can do almost instantaneous damage to your eyesight, so you do need to be a bit careful with these. So never stare into a laser beam, obviously, and also don't look at bright reflection. So if something kind of dazzles your eyes, just turn your head and look away from it. Also, when you need to move the laser around on your desk, make sure that there's no possibility that you're going to shine it at somebody else accidentally. There's a switch here at the nose of the laser that shuts off the beam, so it's not actually turned off, but the beam is blocked. You can unblock it this way, and the on-off switch is actually at the back of the laser. So either of those are good if you need to move the laser around. Either block the beam or turn it off before you adjust things around. And for the experiment itself, you keep your laser level on the desk, and then everybody's eyeballs are going to be up above that level. The first thing you're going to want to do is attach the base that the laser is going to sit on to the interferometer. So one end of it has two screw holes on the end of it, and they're going to attach here. So you can hook it under these little C-shaped things, and then the screws are going to attach it to those C-shaped clamps. These C-shaped clamps also have leveling screws, so these two screws. So you adjust the leveling by adjusting down here underneath, but there are lock screws on top that are going to hold these things in place once you have got everything leveled. So to begin with, just loosen these a little bit, and then you'll be leveling your laser beam with them later. The next thing you're going to do is put your laser on here. So you stick it onto that base and go ahead and turn it on. So like I said, the on-off switch is at the back of the laser, and then there's also this beam blocker here. So I do have my beam showing right now. Now you want to level your laser such that the beam is going to be moving parallel to the surface of the interferometer. So one good way to do that is to take a piece of paper and mark where the beam hits it, and then just move the piece of paper down the track and make sure that the beam is roughly hitting the same mark on the page all the way along. The way in which you adjust the leveling is, again, you're going to just reach under here and adjust these screws at the bottom to move the front of the laser up and down. When you're happy with your leveling, you're also going to be tightening the tops of these screws down, but don't do that yet because we're not quite finished. The next thing we want to ensure is that the beam is hitting the center of this movable mirror. And I know it doesn't look like it moves, but when we twist this knob, it does move this mirror back and forth. So this one's called the movable mirror, even though right now it looks pretty stationary. So to adjust this, again, adjust your leveling if you need to, if it's not hitting the center of the mirror. And if it's not hitting the center of the mirror in this direction, you can grab the back of your laser and move it back and forth. So I can twist this whole laser back and forth a little bit, and you can see how it's changing where my beam hits. So I adjust that to hit the mirror, and we're still not quite done, because now we want to move our heads over here and check whether the beam is actually reflecting right back into the aperture of the laser. So we want it to come over here, hit this mirror, and then come right back onto itself. So here's what I mean by that. This is the camera looking back towards the aperture of the laser, and you can see that the laser beam is being reflected not quite back into the aperture. So we want to grab the back of the laser and just shift it side to side a little bit until that beam is going right back on itself. So once we're happy with that, with the beam reflecting off this mirror and coming straight back to the aperture, then we can tighten down our leveling screws. So you just tighten the tops, snug fit, to lock everything in place. So if they're not already attached, you want to put on this beam splitter, which is another little mirror, but it actually allows light to go through it as well. And there's also a mirror over here that should be attached, but if not, you'll attach it. We're going to orient this guy at 45 degrees to the laser beam. And the idea here is that some of the light is going to leak through this, hit this mirror, reflect back, reflect off the back of this guy, and head over to this screen. And at the same time, some of the light's going to hit the front of this, reflect off it this way, hit this mirror, go forward, some of it again gets through, and we'll get some light on the screen from that beam as well. So that's why it's called a beam splitter, is some of the light is going this way, and some of the light's going this way. So it splits into two paths. You want to orient this such that those two beams of light on the screen are as close together as possible. So you get them as close as you can, 
and then you'll tighten down the brass nut to hold your beam splitter in place. So that's pretty close, and then I'll tighten this down a bit. Doesn't matter that they're not on top of each other, because we're going to fix that now with these two knobs. So I'm actually going to tweak this a little bit to make it more wrong, just so you can see what I'm doing. But you can use these two knobs to adjust the X and Y of those two beams. So we can just adjust things such that those two beams of light are sitting right on top of each other. So you do this as accurately as you can, because it will make a difference to whether or not you see fringes in the next part. You get the two beams sitting right on top of each other as accurately as you can. And by the way, you had two things that sat on magnetic brackets. One of them can be a little screen you put right here. So if you don't want to shine things on the wall or it's not convenient to, feel free to use this little guy. And next, you're going to use the other little element that sat on a magnetic bracket, which was this lens. So if you've got these two beams of light sitting on top of each other as accurately as you can, then you stick the lens in there and adjust it around until you get sort of a pattern like this. And it may not be easy to see, but there are some diffraction fringes in here, meaning that there are little dark and light stripes in a sort of a curved pattern on here. So we can't see them terribly well. To get them more visible, you're going to adjust these two screws in order to get a better fringe pattern. So you can just very carefully adjust these and see what makes the fringe pattern more noticeable or less noticeable. And try and get the bullseye right on top of the area that you're looking at. So again, I'm not sure how much of this you can see in the video, but I'll show you in a close-up in just a moment. So you get something that kind of looks like a bullseye on your screen, and then you're ready to take some data. So here is a fringe pattern on my screen, and you can see the curved lines, but you can't really see the bullseye. So I'm just going to adjust the knobs on my mirror very carefully to try and get the center of the bullseye right on my screen. So something like that should work. So what we're going to be doing in this first part of the experiment is we'll be moving the position of this movable mirror via this knob. So when I move this back and forth, you can actually see the fringe pattern on the screen changing. So I can change it in either direction. So you want to start with this sort of in the middle of the scale, roughly at the four on the shaft here, and then you'll rotate this one full counterclockwise turn. And for all your data taking, you're only going to turn in this direction. The reason why is that there's something called mechanical backlash, which just means that if I'm turning this back and forth, then when I start turning in one direction, there's going to be a little delay between when I start turning and when this starts moving. And that's enough to actually affect our results. So we start with the knob sort of in the middle, we turn one full counterclockwise turn, and then for the data taking, we're only going to turn the knob in that same direction. And that means we never have to worry about the mechanical backlash due to changing directions on the mirror. So now we want to start moving our mirror and keeping track of how many fringes go past a certain point on the screen. So if you're using this little guy, you would orient things such that there is a major line on the screen lined up with one of your fringes. But since I'm doing this on the screen, I'm going to tape a piece of paper here, just so I can mark it up later. And I'm going to mark the location of one of my dark fringes. So I put a black line on there. Next, I'm going to take a reading off of the vernier scale. If you're not sure how to read this, there's an appendix in your lab manual that explains how this works. So you take a reading off of this scale and record it. That'll be your initial reading of the micrometer. And then you're going to start turning this, remember, in the counterclockwise direction. And you want to count how many fringes on the screen go past. So I put my mark on a dark fringe. I'm going to count how many dark fringes go past it. And you should count up to about 30. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 27, 28, 29, and there's 30. And then I would take a reading off my micrometer again. So you'll then be able to subtract one minus the other to get the total distance that you moved this mirror for 30 fringes. And they recommend you do this a couple of different times. I would call three times the bare minimum and maybe five would be better. So you would again just start turning this in the same direction count up 30 fringes, make sure you record the initial position and the final position, and then you just repeat it a few times.
for each of those trials, you're going to calculate the distance that the movable mirror moved, and then using that you calculate the wavelength of the laser light. And if you do five trials, that means you'll have five wavelengths, average them together to get your final answer. So in part B, we're going to need to use this little gizmo. So this consists of a little chamber of air, and it's got clear windows on the ends, and it's attached to a hand pump here. And so this allows you to pump out some of the air that's in the chamber here. So if I push this down, you can see the reading on the scale changes. So I can pump out quite a bit of air, although there becomes a point where you can't get any more out, even if you push some more. And if you need to let the air back in, there's a little red toggle switch back here, which just releases the air back into the chamber. The units on this are slightly old-fashioned ones. They're centimeters of mercury. So you'll be measuring things in centimeters of mercury. And one quantity that you want to measure before you start applying this to your interferometer is you want the length of the air chamber inside here. So that'll be from the inside of one of these windows to the inside of the other one. So you just grab your ruler and measure from the inside edge of one of the clear windows to the inside edge of the other window. You will also need the atmospheric pressure, and if there's no way to measure it in the room, then assume it's going to be 76 centimeters of mercury. So next, I'll be showing you what you do to your interferometer with this guy. So you're not going to be changing the position of your movable mirror at all in this part of the experiment. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to put your air chamber in between the beam splitter and the movable mirror, and then you're going to use the pump to pump out the air, and you're going to see how many fringes go by while you're doing that. So you'll notice that as I push the air out of the chamber, the fringes are going past on the screen. So you're going to be counting those. Now one thing you want to do before you start is you need to orient this chamber such that it is parallel to the beam. And how do you do that? Well, what you do is you watch what's going on on the screen, and you twist this back and forth a little bit. And what you should see is that things seem to change in sort of a symmetric way. So you'll be able to figure out exactly when your chamber is oriented parallel to the beam. So once this is oriented, then you're ready to start taking data. So first of all, pump out just enough air to get the needle on the scale. So not even one complete push of the handle will give you that. So you record this as your initial pressure. And then you want to watch how many fringes go by your mark on the screen as you're pumping out the air. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And so you just keep slowly pumping out the air and counting how many fringes go by. And you want as many fringes as possible for this part of the experiment, so just keep going until you can't pump out any more air. So if you keep going, eventually you'll find that you just can't get any more air out. And once you get to that point, you record that as your final pressure. So you'll have an initial pressure, final pressure, and you'll have counted how many fringes went by on the screen between those two. And by the way, some people actually prefer to pump out all the air and then to release it back and count the fringes going by as the air is going back into the chamber. So personally, I find this works a little too fast to be comfortable, but you can, for example, very slowly let the air back in and count the fringes as they go by. So either method will work. Use whichever one is most comfortable for you. So once you've done all this, just like in Part A, they recommend that you do it all again several times. So again, three is kind of okay, but I think five trials would be better. So repeat the experiment, and for each of your trials, you're going to calculate an index of refraction for air, and then you'll average all those values together for your final value. 